Let's get started again. Just want to finish off briefly on something we were doing earlier, and then we'll move you into an exercise called Future Backwards, yeah? Which is kind of, it's called a side casting technique, and I'll explain that later. So you've got forecasting, which you try and look forward. Back casting, you move backwards from a desired future state. Side casting, you cast around to try and find what's feasible. Right? So we're going to introduce you to one of those and, and bring it in shortly. Um, but I just thought I'd complete on some of the other stuff. Has anybody ever heard the phrase, why didn't we join at the dots? It's generally done after there's been a Royal Commission of Inquiry or something like that, or a you know, congressional inquiry. After the event, everybody can tell you we should have joined at the dots. Yeah, everybody familiar with that phrase? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's called retrospective coherence or the benefit of hindsight. Well, just a simple problem for you. If I have four dots, um, then there are six linkages that can form between the dots. So there are 64 possible patterns. Sorry, the color isn't coming out, the green's gone. Basically, a pattern is a dot, a link, or any combination of dots or linkages. Yeah. So basically, if I go into that, four dots, six linkages, 64 patterns. If I go up to 10 dots, how many patterns are there? Guesses, fast. <laughs> Come on, I want to figure. 200. 10, 150? Sorry, Jack, what you have? 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. It's not a factorial, but I get where you're at there. <laughs> um, how many people think 500 is too little? Too much? No, it's definitely more. Want to have another guess? What's more interesting, the more senior people are, the lower they estimate. It's called the Emperor's Chessboard, if you go back to traditional yeah, storytelling. The yeah, the, the first rice. grain of rice. Grain of rice it's like, what's the probability of two players on a soccer field having the same birthday? Come on, figures fast. Guess. Hmm? Percentage, what's the probability percentage of two players on the pitch having the same birthday? I don't want you to calculate, I want you to come up with what figure you'd think of fast if you had to assess it. 10%. It's 48%. Right? Now, at what we traditionally underestimate these things. Right? And that's a problem. Yeah? Um, this is a significant issue because how many dots do you think there are in the human system? Therefore, how many possible patterns can form? With the benefit of hindsight, everybody can tell you what was significant, but hindsight doesn't need the foresight. Yeah? And if you look at 9-11, the woman who spotted that they were being trained to fly and take off at land gets heralded as a heroine. But the reality is somebody was always bound to spot that. Yeah, somebody always spots something in advance of a crisis. It's just how the hell do we pay attention to it? And putting them in charge is a big mistake because the chance of them doing it next time is the same chance as everybody else. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any difference, but you've still got the same probability yeah, involved in it. So if you want the formula, that's it. But that may, kind of like makes a key point. Yeah? The other thing is coming back. This is another of these fitness landscapes. This is actually one drawn. This is the whole population of Singapore. Uh, which is looking at the degree to which people are pragmatic to the extent to which they'll compete. Yeah, which is actually looking at the self to which they focus individually. Now, you won't see this in this immediately. These are sophisticated, and you need some experience on them. But fundamentally, it shows that competition in Singapore is not associated with individuals. If it's pragmatic competition, it's associated with family groups. Mm. Yeah, which actually makes a big difference to their economic policy. But again, nobody can challenge that. That's 10,000 Singaporeans telling stories on a continuous basis in that. Now, that's distributed cognition. Right? Now, we've been through this several times. Remember the farmers counting, the, counting at the county fair? Or the, the American submarine? So I thought I'd just give you a little test to see how good you are at this. All right? So if I give you a routine numbers task, then actually the average of all of the group should be the right answer. So if you go through it, you'll get it. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do, now some of you may have seen this video before, so please, as, you as I start to explain this, 
If you've seen it before, shut up. If I capture anybody proving how clever they are by turning to their next door neighbor, you're in trouble, right? So I'm going to show you a film. In it, there are six students. Three have got white t-shirts, three have got black t-shirts. Everybody got that? Your task is to count the number of times the kids with a white t-shirt pass a basketball. If you've seen this before, put your hand up and say nothing. OK, respond the way you responded the first time you saw it. Yeah? OK, so just to make it difficult, there are two balls in play. So you really are going to have to focus, right? Um, and I had to show this over a dozen times to a group of sociologists in Melbourne University before they got the right answer. I do not want to have to stop the film frame by frame and argue about what is or is not a pass with a bunch of ainly retentive individuals who can't cope with the fact they got the wrong answer. Right? So they make look here, if the ball leaves the hands of somebody in a white t-shirt and it arrives in somebody else's hands, no matter how it got there, by whatever route, with however many bounces, behind how many people, it's one pass. Everybody got that? Okay, I'll start it now. Count the number of times the people with white t-shirts pass the basketball. Okay, numbers? 15. 12 or less, put your hands up. 12 or less? Okay, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 or more. Okay, the answer is actually 14. We've had numbers as high as 50 and as low as 4. All right, but actually that's not a bad distribution around <coughs> the answer. Anything made it difficult or easy to count? One pass, I think, that would differentiate the 14 and the 15, where it was another pass, it was more like a voluntary thing. It looked like the guy dropped the ball. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. That's, yeah, anything else? And the reason why I said 24 is when they were, when it was leaving their hands, when they dropped it down, I was counting it as a pass. Ah, right, so you doubled up, so you're already 12. Okay. <laughs> Anybody notice that white only passed to white? No. Yeah. Now, once you get that, it's very fast to count. Nothing else anybody spotted? Monkey. How many people saw the gorilla? <laughs> right, don't feel good about this. There are only three reasons why you should see the gorilla, and you may not like any of them. Right? Let me show you the video again. This time, watch the whole movie. <coughs> Especially around now. <laughs> That's what we call in the business a weak signal. Mm -hmm. If that guru had just gone mad and killed all those students, then you've all been held up before the courts for manslaughter. <laughs> but the reality is very few people ever see the gorilla. Mm -hmm. There are three reasons you'd see it. One is you've been on too many management courses and you've learned not to follow the instructions. Mm -hmm which point you're getting too clever for your own good and you won't learn anything. The other is you weren't really paying attention and woke up halfway through, which is kind of like acceptable on a sunny afternoon. Third is you're partially autistic, which you shouldn't take badly because economists and computer scientists nearly always see the gorilla. There's a high degree of partial autism in those departments. It's like dyslexia is tightly correlated with innovation. Yeah, I'm dyslexic. Dysle I mean, I never understand why everybody wants all the words. They're all there. Why are you worried about the order? And dyslactics see connections between things that other people don't see. But they're very poor at other things. Right? So actually, we're now starting to realize single models of education are a fundamental mistake for society. Yet you need different types of ability in different circumstances. Big problem, for example, on competence models for leaders is trying to define a single model for leadership when leadership is actually highly contextual is very dangerous. Mm. Yeah? I wonder if that gorilla had a white shirt on with you seen it because you're your eye just to look at the whites because they, only yeah, that actually is, uh, but that's life, right? The other thing is if I'd taken half of you into one room and shown you pictures of the jungle, I'd have increased the probability you saw the gorilla enormously. If I'd given another half counting tasks, I'd have reduced the probability you see the gorilla. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, now, actually, this is because of the way we make decisions. So faced with, you know, looking at data, the most you scan for anybody in this room it's 5% of what's available to you if you really focus. 
Most of the time it's a lot less than that. If any of you were Chinese, it would go up to 10%. Um, the, the, the evolutionary requirements of pictorial languages mean that Chinese brains are more context-focused, less object-focused. So if you actually show, this is probably relevant for what you're about to face, all right? So if you actually show a picture of a tiger drinking from a stream in a forest to American students, they see the tiger, miss the forest. Chinese students see the forest, miss the tiger. Yeah? And actually that accounts for foreign policy, if you think about it. Chinese empires actually don't conquer people, they absorb the barbarians. It's what they're doing with capitalism, it's what they always do. The barbarians invade, they invade, they make them Chinese within a generation. There's a different pattern, but either way, yeah, that's the most you're going to focus on. So if you look at this, and a radiologist, let's go back to the original research on this. A radiologist scans 3 or 4% of an x-ray. Get scared if you go into a hospital. That's what they scan. They then match it against 30 to 40,000 patterns stored on their long-term memory associated with their skill and training as a radiologist. And the most frequently used patterns are nearer the surface and get activated first. And they do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. And that's how we evolve to make decisions. We make decisions very quickly by matching against patterns of previous experience based on a partial data scan. Now, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense in evolutionary terms. Think about the first hominoids, you know, not too far north of here. Um, something large and yellow with sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Like a good decision. Do you want to artistically scan all available data? Look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African belt in your local available knowledge library and then having an identified lion, look at best practice case studies on how to deal with lions. By that time, the only thing which would have been used to you is the escape manual from the digestive tract of a large carnivore. And as far as I know, nobody's written that to date. Yeah? We evolved to make decisions very quickly based on partial data scans. It's why actually Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, is considered a total disaster by anybody who knows anything about cognitive neuroscience. It's a classic journalist picking examples that support a popular thesis. That is a book called The Invisible Gorilla, which was actually written to deliberately hit Blake. And by people who were concerned, managers were taking it seriously. The Invisible Gorilla. The Invisible Gorilla. It's actually by the guys who produced that film. There's a new version of that, by the way, now, in which everybody knows about the gorilla. So actually, you don't realize the people change, the curtains change, the balls change shape. And you don't notice that either. Yeah? Because actually, we didn't evolve to scan everything. The only people who do are autistic. It's actually why autism is a real problem, because they're scanning everything and they're making logical decisions. And we didn't evolve to scan everything and make logical decisions, it's counter survival. So you actually want to convey a message to somebody? What will you do? They'll actually take five, three or four percent of what you say, they'll activate patterns based on recent experience, and that's how they'll scan it. So if you run a new project, for example an IT roller, people don't look at it rationally, they scan it through filters of the last three big IT projects you run. And that actually leads to a key thing called double hit marketing. You have to actually send out one message to activate the brain before you send out the message you want. That's actually how brand works. Yeah? So for example, if I see that lovely little white apple symbol with a little bit chunked out of it, it activates entirely favorable patterns. On the other hand, if I see a sort of rectangular shape with four twirly colors in it, it activates deeply negative patterns. It doesn't matter what they do, I'm going to see it negatively. That's how brand works. Brand activates the brain. The brain can only handle four neuron clusters at any one time. Now it swaps them in and out very quickly, but fundamentally the brain has limited energy to scan for novelty. So most of the time we do what's called autonomic processing. Yeah? Now this is actually what the left brain actually does. It doesn't do emotional and rational. That's actually a fiction. The idea you have a left brain which is emotional, the right brain is rational, is just not true. It's one of those popular beliefs people love to propagate and it gets spread as if it was truth, it isn't. What actually happens is the left brain handles autonomic response. So when your hand pulls away from a fire, your brain activates after you've pulled your hand away. Now, idiots like Richard Dawkins think this means you haven't got free will. The reality is it's a trained response of the whole body, which is part of your extended consciousness. So your body trains itself to do all sorts of things automatically, like driving. You can't trust kids until they've driven for two or three years is it takes that amount of time, remember the London taxi drivers? For their body to train itself to do things without thinking about it. Which is why the Australians actually don't allow kids to drive with passengers other than their relatives for two years after passing their test. Because the risk of accident <coughs> goes up exponentially with the number of passengers for young people. Yeah. Would be an example. 
So there's a whole body of stuff which actually our body has to train. Now, if the autonomic side of the brain, which handles something like 20 million items per second, yeah, we're pretty impressive. Yeah, and that does it without thinking about it. Your brain is activating to check if the pattern was right this time to lay down a different one. So it's a reflective thing. If that doesn't work, the novel to receptive aspect of the brain clicks in. That's the right brain. That handles 20,000 items per second. It's slower. It takes a huge amount of energy, so we don't do it unless we've really got to do it. Um, so a woman once, if, if, this is a classic idea, if you ever actually have a relative who suffers massive brain injury and they're still alive, maximize your revenue earning potential. Cognitive neuroscientists hang around hospitals waiting for people to come in with brain damage because it's the only way they can do experiments. They're all desperate for somebody to come in with a steel rod driven through their frontal cortex because they want to replicate the Phineas Gage experiment because that wasn't done properly. Right? So either way, a woman lost most of her right arm and her right brain in a fatal accident. It's amazing what some people actually survive. It wasn't fatal, sorry, it was just really bad. I mean, sometimes a pinprick kills you, other time you can lose. But either way, it meant she didn't realize she'd lost her right arm. The brain has lost its novelty receptive part. They gave her a tray, tray of drinks to hold. She actually tried to pick them up. They spilled all over her. Her brain created a conspiracy theory about how people had thrown water at her. It wasn't until they electrically stimulated the small remnant of her right brain that she realized she'd lost her right arm. You see why we use the triads on surveys? You've got to activate the novelty receptive part of the brain, otherwise it goes on automatic pilot. So if you want to get people to think differently, you've got to actually effectively create a disruptive pattern. Because otherwise, they'll just go with the flow of previous patterns and they won't see the gorillas. It also makes the point about distributed cognition. Somebody always sees the gorilla. If you just rely on a small number of people, they won't see the gorillas. An extended network, the gorillas are more likely to be seen. Remember those yellow dots? Yeah, outliers are important. Now, trying to actually pretend you can stop yourself doing this is stupid. And just to give you some other data based on this, the minute somebody conducts more than two interviews, their brain forms a subconscious hypothesis and they only listen to things that match that hypothesis thereafter. This is a fun question. If you're ever employing management consultants, ask them how they cope with the pattern entrainment of multiple interviews. And after you've explained them, watch them squirt. Because they've all, most of them say, look, I can work out after two or three interviews what's going on. Actually, the point is they just fit in, in a pattern of what they've done before. <coughs> yeah. I mean, the find and replace function in Word was designed for management consultants. But either way, the point is, right, that's the reality of the human condition. So you can't afford to have a limited number of people who think like you feeding you data. Yeah, and that's where you start to move in whole of employee engagement. And you've seen what we don't do in the narrative? So with the Singapore system, let's take an example. We're incentivizing people. Um, this is part of the next rollout next year, big rollout. Um, every, I think, actually come think of it, this is something you might want to replicate. I'm told that Fundamentally, what they're doing is every, I think, one in 500 passengers with an MRT card will be incentivized with a discount to tell stories throughout their journey. Yeah, so there's QR codes, they scan the QR code, it prompts for a story, they tell a story. We want to know why people are traveling, because we're working on a 75-year transport strategy for Singapore. <coughs> and knowing where they travel isn't enough, we want to know why. So we're gathering those stories, and you can start to see the first products of that with that previous thing as we move through. Now that's actually an alternative form of market research because you've got real-time data coming in. But the other point is there's two things we can do with that network. If something goes wrong on the MRT, and just to tell you, Singapore ministers had to resign because people got trapped in an MRT station for an hour. Hmm. Uh, in London, that happens every week. I mean, we regard it as a good week where that doesn't happen, but never mind, it shows a different society. But actually, you can use the network to communicate information. So you push information out through a human network, which means you've actually got, you can quiet things down really fast. Because if somebody in the crowd who's another passenger knows what's going on, you can also ask questions of those people in real time. Remember wisdom of the crowds. And the phrase there, you build networks for ordinary purpose, you activate for extraordinary needs. <coughs> yeah? You don't use social computing because you can't trust the sources. People are getting very excited about this. They're saying, we, we, we'll monitor Twitter. Yeah, you should monitor Twitter. These things can go disastrously wrong. American Airlines are brilliant <coughs> on this. They are actually, if you're an executive platinum holder, which some of us are because we're sad individuals who travel all the time, I'm just about to hit 5 million miles. And I've got 5 million miles on Star Alliance already, so that shows you how sad it is. Right? Um, and I've also got something like 8,000 Twitter followers. If I tweet a single thing about American Airlines, they respond within 30 seconds. 
because they know if they're frequent flyers with large Twitter following and start to say negative stuff. Yeah? But I'm now gaming it. I can guarantee I can get an upgrade. Yeah, because I know they want to keep me happy. Right? So I'm gaming the system. There are kids in New York who pretended they were trapped under beds in Hawaii, sorry, in Haiti, and needed rescuing using fake IP addresses because they thought it was fun to divert the rescue services. Yeah? Human beings aren't nice. And if you actually have an uncontrolled network, you can't trust the results. So this is, you create trusted networks for ordinary purposes. You get this point? What you're trying to do is create the scanning mechanism. Large numbers of people constantly gathering material, constant feedback. You can see things, you can intervene quickly. Yeah? If you wait for conventional approaches, when I came through Heathrow, I mean, Terminal 3, just by the way, don't go through Terminal 3 at the moment. There's some sort of workers go slow going on, which is informal. Yeah? So they're actually checking. One bag in three is getting pulled out for secondary and they haven't increased the staff. It took me 45 minutes to get through security, yet to go to Singapore. 45 minutes, because they pulled my bag out. There were 15 bags in line. They're doing one at a time very slowly. It's a bloody nightmare. So as I come out, I hit the, you know, the smiley face thing. I hit the really bad one. You've learned nothing yeah? Yeah, from actually what's going on. You can't respond in real time. Yeah? So that's the principle. So I thought I'd show that because fundamentally, and this is a model Gary Klein and I created some time ago, it's called the see, attend, act model of sense making. It says whether you see the data, whether you pay attention to the data, and whether you will act on what you see are three completely separate processes. And the trouble is traditional decision theory says if you put the right information in front of the right people at the right time, and they have the right training and the right competencies, they will make the right decisions. That is actually nothing to do with humanity. Whether they even see it, remember you didn't see the gorilla? Whether they'll pay attention to it, even if they see it, is another matter. Whether they act on it is a matter again. So again, a 9-11 example. You may not know this, but if um, Gore hadn't been subject to a judicial queue, and I mean, Gore actually won that presidential election, um, but the Supreme Court overruled it. I mean, how anybody can have a Supreme Court elected and pretty, I never understood, but never mind. Um, there was a congressional order which he would have signed, which had had F-14s in permanent patrol above Washington and New York, with authorization to shoot down hijacked American, hijacked American aircraft. Because the Clinton Al-Qaeda team had worked out what Al-Qaeda's strategy was. When Bush came in, it was thrown out as classic democratic paranoia about Al-Qaeda, and the whole thing was cancelled. Now, of course, the towers go down, but of course, everyone wants to be unified, so nobody brings it up. Actually, I'm pretty sure the Republicans would have brought it up if it was the other way around, but never mind, the Democrats don't. Yeah. So we had Gore and others in the Blue Mountains after this, and I remember saying to Gore, would you actually have signed the order? And he thought about it, and he said, probably not. Because to authorize American air military aircraft to shoot down hijacked civilian aircraft, in before 9-11, in the context of the mistake over the Korean airliner and the, you know, the Airbus in the Gulf, yeah. is wrong. In the context of 9-11, it's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah? So whether somebody can act on it is, is a nothing altogether. That's the context shift. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like a key important model. Anybody who says all of those three things happen automatically is just lying. Yeah? It's whether I see something. And that's where things like social networks come into place. If somebody you trust says to look at something you do, we did field ethnography and when I was in IBM in the big consultancy KM systems. And they all claimed huge success because they had massive access. When we actually observed what people did, they didn't read the document. They found the name of the author and phoned them up and had a conversation. Because we need human validation before we waste time on explicit material. And there are better ways to do that than actually written documents. So I say, hold that one in mind. Yeah. Okay, it's time you did something. Middle of the afternoon, this is the real graveyard shift, it's not after lunch, it's actually the middle of the afternoon when it's hot. What I want you to do on the tables now, and you need to clear a space in the middle and use two, you've got two pieces of butcher paper. Yeah, or flip chart. What is it? Is it butcher paper or flip chart paper over here? <laughs> flip chart, okay, you go with the British norm, yeah? The Americans talk about is butcher paper. And you're flying the butcher's apron out there at the moment, so never mind, right? Irish background. Okay, so I want you to arrange these two sheets together so you've got a landscape type thing on the page in front of you. So basically, your two sheets of paper form a workspace like this. Everybody got that?
Okay, now this is the fun time. This is when I get to throw hexagons at you. And given the state of South African cricket at the moment, I'm going to be interested to see if you manage to catch these or not. Yay! Is nobody even paying attention on that? Yeah, okay. All right, okay, it's improving, right? Now, what I want you to do is we're going to look at the history of the how trick. And I want you to start off, imagine you know, you've gone to London or Washington or somebody where nobody knows about this, and I want you in two or three phrases to summarize the current state of affairs. Yeah? And each, you know, you've got one, two or three. I want you to write the phrase on a hexagon, only one phrase per hexagon, and you're only allowed three. Yeah, this is the elevator pitch. You've got, you know, you've got a journey between the first and the twentieth floor. You've got to say one, two, or three things which accurately summarise the current state of the how train. Okay. okay. Everybody got that? Um, you do it as a group. You have to agree it as a group. Okay. Yeah. On each table. And then, it, sorry. The current state is okay. Yeah. Now I just I know just be careful and I won't I, I will repeat the instruction but I won't explain it. I want you to use one, two or three phrases which describe the current state of how train. That, that's all I said. And that's all I will say. Okay. Right? Once you've got those, if you can imagine a line which is halfway across there and two thirds. And I want you to put the hexagons. Yeah? There. Like that. Now, if you only got one, it, it's easy. If you've got two, that's fine. You can have one, two, or three. It's your call. Okay? So, you know, you're asked, what the hell is this how train thing about? Two or three phases. Yeah, what's the current state? How would you describe it? Yeah? And you're only allowed one, two, or three. I want each one written on a separate hexagon and clustered together at that point. Go. Um, I'm just looking at what you said from the I put the pink ones on one side. You can't use the pink ones for the next exercise, yeah? And what you're now on to is yellow, so let's really test the reactions. Now, missed on that time. Okay. Now, what I want you to do, and I, can I emphasize the instruction here? You do these one at a time. You can't, if I see you brainstorming them, I will come and pick them all up and throw them in the bin. Yeah? I want you to think about the most significant event that happened before the current state, which meant that you are where you are. This is called a turning point. So the most significant point in world history, if you don't know it, is when Llewellyn failed to commit his troops to support Simon de Montfort at the Battle of Evesham, as a result of which Wales eventually became conquered by the English. Right, if you didn't know this, you now know it. <laughs> yeah, it's a key aspect of it. If he'd only committed his troops, Simon de Montfort would have kept, yeah, but either way. Right? Now you can all think about similar turning points. Yeah? And turning points are what, yeah, it's a decision somebody made or something which happened, which could have bifurcated but actually it went away which arrived in the current state. Everybody got that principle? This right. the project. Yeah. yeah. So whatever you decided to interpret it as. What's the event which happened before the current state, which is the last significant turning point? Agree it, write it on the hierarchy, put it on the board, and then tell me you've done that. But agree it as a group. As a group. Agree as a group. No, only one. Okay, it's the most recent, not the biggest. It's the most recent event. Is it the most significant event? Most. Okay. Most. The, the most. Most. It's significant and recent. Okay. Right. So if you had to say, if that had panned differently, we'd have been in a different place. But in the recent past, what would it be? And the 
one or by what people. Why we do it this way later? So, how many? Do you want to go further? Okay. Right. Then use the pink. What I want you to do, remember how you described the current state of affairs? And I want you to imagine a future state which we'll call heaven. And I want you to describe it in one, two, or three statements and put the hexagons up there. And I want you to do hell and put it down there. Now, just to make it clear, heaven is impossibly good. This isn't what we think might happen in the future. This is so good, it won't happen. And that's so bad, it would never be allowed to happen. Yeah, describe it now. I want you to a future state called heaven and describe it in one, two, or three phrases, like you described the current state. Put them up here. Hell put it down there. But it isn't a, the best possible situation, the worst. It's impossibly good, impossibly bad. Yeah? Okay. How are we doing, guys? Yeah? <laughs> yes, I get the double meaning of that. Okay. Right, now what you should do, you m yellow, the yellow hexes again. Remember how you step backwards from that? Why don't you step backwards from this? To a point in the past. On that pathway, you're allowed one miracle. In green. Yeah. So start here, go one at a time. You can introduce a miracle, but you go to a point in the past, not the present. So once you've completed, the implication is something different happened here, which took you on the pathway to heaven or a stairway to heaven if you're a dead Led, Led Zeppelin fan. Right? But along that route, you're allowed an act of God. So for example, when we do this on global warming, it's really depressing. Everybody ends up with aliens land and give us with new technology. Right? So you're allowed something like that on the pathway. And the same yellow. Act of God is green. Green is the colour of Wales, so miracles always come in Welsh colours, right? But then I want you to say, yeah. Then I want you to do the same thing. Yeah, you were bloody lucky. Off, offside should have put us ahead, and you should have had your number six red card. Um, I want you to go. I want you to do the same thing going back from hell. So you go step by step, all right? But it's always to a point in the past, not the present. I'll explain why later. And you're allowed a miracle on the roof, or it's, it's an anti-miracle. Right? Okay, guys, you made it? Cool. Okay, I've got two groups have completed and one group who has. How are we doing? Almost there. Almost. Right, each group, hi guys, I want each group to appoint a spokesperson. Now just to say, the spokesperson doesn't have to worry about what's going to happen to them. Right? What's going to happen is I'm going to rotate people around the tables and I want somebody to stay who can explain what you did. Yeah? Now this is again, this is a complex facilitation technique. You don't report back to the group, so then the first group who reports back in trains all the other responses. And you're assuming you can break a problem. You see this in workshops. People break a problem up. Then people go away and solve the problem and come back together. That's OK if it's ordered, but it's not OK if it's complex. If it's complex, multiple teams work in parallel on the same problem because you want to see multiple, multiple opportunities. Right? So we're going to rotate you around. Right? So I know you haven't finished, but we'll do anyway. Right? So each table, who is going to stay and actually tell people what you did? Yeah? This table? <coughs> this table, who's it going to be? Johan. Okay. Now, you don't just go around. When you go around, I want you to ask three questions, yeah? So two of you are going to rotate to the next table. 
Yeah, and we'll go clockwise. And we've now all established clockwise is this way around, haven't we? I'm just checking with you, all right? I get worried about engineers who don't know the difference between clockwise and yeah, anti <laughs> Yeah, 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 okay. Um, which are coming back into fashion. So what I want you to do is I want you, as you look at what somebody's done and have a conversation, I you ask three questions. What was different? What was the same? And what really surprised you? So you've all been through the same process for the same task. I refuse to clarify the task. Is actually the radical difference between you guys and you guys is really interesting. Yeah? What you're trying to do, and this is a key complexity technique, you give people an instruction and see how different groups interpret it. You actually, the difference is more educational than anything else. Yeah? And by the way, I'll explain this technique later. It's used now <coughs> in after action reviews. It's an alternative to lessons learned. And it's actually used in battlefield assessment yeah, in real time. Because it, that <coughs> is, people scan more, but I'll explain why later. Okay, so who's the spokesman here? Yeah, who's staying? Jimmy. Okay, right. Would everybody who isn't a spokesman rotate to the next <coughs> table in the clockwise direction, have a chat with what they did, and identify those three questions? <coughs> <coughs> We have those uprisings, and yeah. those uprisings led to you know, our country being isolated. Okay. What is Haven? Haven is the ITMP 25, yeah. and then scrapping of the toll road. Okay, rotate round to another table, continue the process. It's happening now. Okay, guys. What would let's go through those three questions as a group, all right? Um, so, what was different? Anybody notice any? I mean, there were some obvious big differences, but what did you all notice? I think the bridge. The bridge I think the bridge will go differently. Yeah. Yeah. I think the three teams have the same idea where we are now. So mm -hmm. it seems like the closer you are to the present, the more synergy there is. Yeah. But then going backwards, what, what surprised me is that. These guys went back 80 years, right? And I can't see a relationship between the, the riots in, in my hey, country. One Singapore government one, they actually went back to the 5th century yeah, on current counter-terrorism policy. And that's a noble way of looking at it. It's tracking, but this year, this year, you know, so it's it's a a strategic outlook. They went back, and I don't think, well, no, I couldn't find the linkage because they, it wasn't, for me, key milestone is something that if it didn't happen, you wouldn't have what you're looking at, so you have a project. On this, this table, they had events, they didn't have milestones. Anything that was a big public event, the first trains, you know, they, we, we have a video where the first train is delivered off the ship. Oh, these guys are engineers. They want, they want a train which works and comes to their own house. I mean, they were very yes, focused on that. that yeah. but, but just just on, the, on the history back, we have a video where the train gets off the ship, and the guy goes and he kisses the train. I mean, that okay. is the, the magic. But that's an event, it's not a master. Mm. So that's that. And then uh, what these guys did is that they, 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 they took the future perfect and the future imperfect. So they wanted to run it from the present. So they didn't want to go back. And, uh, that's why I asked them. Oh, they cheated. I haven't seen that. Okay. Yes. <coughs> they, they want to go from there. We don't definitely in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Benny Groom? Can we run this quite quickly, but because it's an exercise. Yeah. Go on. Can I just ask Jack, what is the danger in doing it the other way around? Uh, how do you mean the other way around? We did it the other way around. No, the, the thing is, I think what, and I didn't know it until we did it, is that things can go wrong 
much back in the yeah. past. So you must learn where, where you can start going wrong or in the past where you can start going right. And you can manage that. But if you don't, if, if you don't identify the position, you can't do, you can't do future planning without knowing what went wrong in the past. That's the, that's the argument. And, and if you have events, yeah. and that's why you had a difficulty linking it to events, because that's not it. You mm. need a milestone. So what milestone in the past do you go back to and see if it's wrong? And then, I'm not saying you're right, but he's saying it, it, it things to go wrong. For, for me, the critical thing is you lose political Well, mm. If you lose political support, then you're dead, because then the train will not work. And I mean, we've seen it in our country where Western Cape was taken over by the DA, and the DA just said, man, anything that the ANC did was wrong. So you start getting a, a destruction based on a political ideology and not on the technical <coughs> competency of the, of the project. So. Other comments? Okay, let's just run through the background of this technique, all right? If you're forced to construct it backwards, it's novelty. Remember I talked about the novelty receptive aspect of the brain? It, you actually increases the degree to which you think about the problem. So in a complex world, anything which increases the cognitive load on people is a good thing. Because as you increase the cognitive load, the novelty receptive part of the brain comes in, people think more. So a triangle for indexing stories rather than a Likard scale. Yeah, you increase the cognitive load. Yeah? Um, it's actually a good technique, by the way, and certainly if you have anybody got teenage children at the moment? Have you reached the point where they come back at four o'clock in the morning and after you've hugged them you want to kill them? Everybody been there? Yeah. Right, and they got this wonderfully plausible story involving mobile phone reception and having to look after a friend and it all sounds good. Get them to tell the story backwards. Human beings can lie forwards with alacrity, but lying backwards is almost impossible without inconsistencies creeping into the story. Now, I learned this one from the CIA. It's an interrogation technique. If somebody's got an alibi, you don't let them tell the alibi forwards, you make them tell it backwards again and again, and the inconsistencies come in. Yeah? And again, it's that cognitive load issue. It's too easy to lie forwards, and it's that sort of principle. Secondly, you try not to think about best possible with heaven. You're stretching people's imagination. You'd be amazed how often one group's heaven is another group's hell. It happens very frequently. Right? And not only that, accidents, the act of God, or the act of the devil, people start to realize it's more realistic than they thought. Yeah? Your whole goal here is to extend scanning yeah. in terms of the way it works. So just to put up the slides so you've got the summary. What you're actually doing here, yeah, it's a group timeline technique. What I really want to do, we didn't get the act together, is you would have been on tables maximized for group think. All right? So if you ever do this for real, you want people on tables who think the same way because then the contrast between the different views is more extreme, so the group learns more. Yeah, so you actually don't want, you know, it's, it's heterogeneity, not heterogeneity, you know what I mean, all right? That maximizes the group thing. Um, secondly, the bias comes in, all right? So, you know, it's far too easy people going forward to decide what they want the solution to be and make it happen. <coughs> By going backwards, you prevent that pattern going on. It's also why you don't let people go back to the present, because then they politically game it. Yeah, any timeline which goes to the present gets involved in politics. And as Jack pointed out, if you go to the past, you discover things about the present you hadn't expected, yeah? and you see the differences. Yeah? Um, talked about that. This generates method for other material. It's, it's used for strategy. It's an alternative to traditional timelining. But fundamentally, it's also project review and situational assessment. This is now used in battlefield planning to assess the situation. Or it's done in after action review in different groups. Right? Because the other interesting thing is you're focusing people on fictional lines as well as factual lines. And actually human beings use fiction to, de to describe the present. So one of the paradoxes of lessons learned, if you tell pe I insist that people tell the truth, they will lie. If you let them lie, they will tell the truth. If you actually get successful teams to tell the story of how they failed, you actually find out a lot of things which really went on in the project, and vice versa. <coughs> so it's not just a factual thing in that sense. And remember, fiction is how we learn. We learn through fairy stories. Actually, stories about what might have happened are more powerful communication of best practice than stories about what did happen. Because what did happen can be challenged, 
you know, fictional stories are less likely to be challenged and more likely to be listened to. And coming back to the negativity, if you look at all storytelling traditions, you know, all European ones, all the African ones I've studied, they're actually fairy stories and negative stories. They're dark stories. They may have a happy ending, but they're pretty dark until Hollywood gets hold of them. Right? Um, but fundamentally, the reason is they're there to teach people to avoid failure. That's the purpose of stories for young, is to teach them not to do things. Because that's what we do with kids. We don't teach them what to do, we teach them what not to do, because again, that fits in with that evolutionary strategy. Yeah, so again, that applies to lessons learned programs. In fact, what you really want, if you put the best practice system in place, you're fighting 150,000 years of evolution, which says it's a bad idea. A worse practice database, on the other hand, everybody likes to read. Because we like to learn about failure. And there's all sorts of techniques. These are options for tomorrow. We can actually look at, for example, archetype techniques, which Sonia is an expert on. Because actually, if you create archetypes, it allows people to tell a story about the archetype rather than a story about themselves. And that's far more effective in lessons learned than actually telling what happened to me. You tell a story about the archetype. Yeah, and you actually know, anybody seen Dilbert cartoons? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you actually see, well, if you go into an office, you'll find Dilbert cartoons with the white out and people put their own text in it. Because it's easy to tell you something through a cartoon. And we'll show you a couple of examples. Really interesting one from Absa Bank on that when they tried to work in Soweto. I'll show you that tomorrow yeah, as an example. Um, so either way, that's a technique. Now, if we look at it, yeah, one of you, you do that. But you now start to get multiple groups scanning in multiple ways. This is a technique which you can run very quickly with multiple groups in the company. Remember distributed cognition? And they see radically increasing your scanning capability on a strategic point of view. Yeah? Everybody working in parallel. And say so this is actually called side casting. So that I like that because it allows me to produce really nice pictures of people, you know, squid, you know, doing salmon fishing. I think that's salmon in that case. It might be trout actually, given the river. So if you look at it, we've got a traditional technique which is called forecasting. Now what happens in forecasting is the underlying philosophy is you've got causality. The assumption is I can use the present to predict the future. Yeah, that's what forecasting is about. And we judge people by their accuracy of their forecast. If somebody got it right, we think they're pretty clever. Yeah. Um, and there's whole areas where you can do this. You've really got to justify what you're doing. So the issue is who's got the more plausible explanation? This is one of the big problems with scenario planning, by the way. Every year I get to go to Singapore and spend a week where we take a strategic situation somewhere in the world. And when we did um, we had american chinese relationships two years ago, and we had former secretaries of state, just to give you an idea of the level. And there's two mavericks. I'm a consistent maverick, and then I get a guest maverick every year. So we had Neil Stevenson, if you don't know, science fiction writer, rock trilogy. So yeah. Neil and I, between us, came up with some scenarios we thought were brilliant, but got rejected by the group because that will never happen. Two years later, two of them have happened. So one of the problems is, actually, the real mavericks come up with ideas, but the experts don't accept it, so the scenarios get ignored. And that's one of the problems with scenario planning. Plausibility of scenario to decision makers is a key issue. So that's a problem, right? Because justification is there. Uh, the perspective it takes is, what are the dominant trends? Yeah? Um, likely futures, margin adjustments, how to adapt to trends. It's all about projecting from the present. And if you look at the tools, you've got trend, you've got sensitivity analysis, modeling. You get things like Delphi technique is used across large populations. All of these are about trying to get diversity, but you're trying to forecast a future state so you can plan for it. Now, as you probably gather by now, that's OK for order. Um, but it's a problem where you get onto complexity. Now, the first solution to complexity, this goes back to the system thinkers, was to actually say what we need to do is to focus on backcasting. So the way we handle the complexity is to decide where we want to be and try and get there. Now you see this is used extensively for social change with good purpose. Rather than forecast the, from the present, we say, where would we like to be? What are the blockages which prevent us getting there? Yeah? And this has been used extensively. So here you haven't got linear causality so much. It's teleology. You're looking at final events. It's Basically, and I've taken this from some of the literature on backcasting. Yeah, you can see the references down there. It's about discovering what could actually happen if we thought differently. So it's actually a valuable technique. 
is you say, you know, the thing which is preventing us getting there is that we haven't got a technology which does Y and somebody finds it. Uh, Land Lease, who I work with, we're really good at this. Um, you know Land Lease? They're big civil engineers, Australian. Um, they did pioneering stuff like Darling Harbour development. Yeah, San Francisco waterfront, Blue Water in Kent. Blue Water is brilliant. It's a major shopping centre. Um, but interestingly, it did very clever things. It has a male creche. So somewhere you can dump your husband or your brother or your son so they'll be kept amused while you go shopping. <laughs> and there are three male creches. For different, it's a brilliant idea. Um, they actually got get built the traffic centre for the police in the shopping centre. The police wondered why they were so generous. It meant they didn't have to employ security guards because actually the police are constantly coming and going into the shopping centre. It's great for everybody. Yeah? I mean, they were brilliant, right? And Stuart, who's the main guy in charge of it, I mean, he went round every Labour Party meeting in every ward in the area. Now, these are Labour Party is a Socialist Party. Well, it used to be the Socialist Party. It's three or four people in their sitting room planning for a revolution which will never happen, right? <laughs> he went round each of these things and listened to their concerns because they were all worried about a big shopping centre. There's some brilliant stuff. I mean, you know, can't tell you all of them, but I mean, actually the best one was they decided the architect, who was a brilliant architect, he wanted a, a lake in front, but they couldn't actually make it. And they couldn't find a solution to actually get the, the rock out. And so Stuart and Neville flew over the area, saw a quarry next door. They bought the quarry, drove a channel through, and drove the stuff through and dumped it in the quarry. And they just wouldn't take no for an answer. Right? Lots of hero stories. Um, extended parking bays, all sorts of stuff like that. Now, there were several interesting things about, you know, they wouldn't accept no for an answer. Um, and they also had some interesting things. So we were going around, we were capturing stories of failure. And we found lots of stories of failure. So we'd say, anything go wrong on a project? And this bunch of cynical Australian engineers would say, oh, you want my crane story, do you? And they trot out this story of extreme failure where they cost the company millions. And I've never seen it before or since. And I went to Stuart eventually and said, Stuart, what's this with the crane story? And he said, I wondered if you'd find that. And I thought, you bastard, you were checking me out. And he said, what happened is many years ago, we had a new civil engineer. He graduated by correspondence course from Alice Springs. If you know Alice Springs, it's right in the middle of Australia. So he said he knew about tides in theory, but not in practice. His first job was in Sydney Harbour. He tied a mobile crane to the delf. He didn't allow for tidal adjustment. The tide came in, the tide went out, the crane collapsed into the ocean. He had millions of dollars of investment written off. And he said, the foreman, yeah, the, the, chief, the chief guy phoned me up and said, I've probably got to fire him, but he's a bright guy. Would you mind seeing him? So Stuart said, I took him out for lunch. And he said, after half an hour, I decided he'd learned his lesson. He actually had a lot of potential. So I told him he was now a real engineer because he'd lost his first crane. He said, then I told him what would happen to him if he ever did it again. He said, at Lowdown, every now and then, every new guy, the minute he makes a mistake, I have to go take him out for lunch and go through the same <laughs> process. And I said, you're brilliant. Because you've institutionalized a ritual by which people confess to a mistake and learn from it, but they don't make another one. And you've actually managed that really well. Yeah? Now, he was a good example, and Landis did that all the time. Yeah? They basically said, this is where we want to be. How do we close the gap? And the way they did project reviews is three of them would fly around the world and beat up project teams. Yeah, they didn't have review processes, they didn't have forms, they didn't have reports. I remember Stuart saying, go and gather stories because nobody bothers with reports. Yeah, this is, we tell stories. So they would fly around, they'd review the project. Whatever the project came up with, they would get beaten up. Because these guys were really experienced guys. They'd been there, they'd done it. And they just beat people up. Now, not nastily, it was just they always found a hole in what people had done. So actually what we got is people would say, you know, they did this brilliant thing in Blue Water. They made all the glass look like oyster houses, so they made it fit like Kent. Yes, yeah, so you've got these you know, beautiful glass things. And he said, we got everybody excited. Neville came along, he took one look at it, he said, how are you going to clean them? And he said, God, and then the corporate seagull came in and shat all over us. We hadn't thought about how to clean it. Yeah? And then the Neville didn't say, this is a solution. He said, why don't you go and talk to these people? He gave them three or four names. Three months later, they created a whole new technology about cleaning glass. Now, actually, there's several lessons in that, all right? How you communicate. People with deep experience working around not telling people what to do, but finding holes in what they do. I got part of the ideas for ritual descent from Stuart. 
Yeah, and then actually linking and connecting with people who might come up with completely novel. Because when people have got a real problem, they come up with solutions. Yeah? But again, this concept of not accepting, and you know, backcasting is very powerful for that. Yeah? It's generally used for society problems, where you're trying to flip the way that people think. Yeah? Um, the danger is, and I would actually say the ANC are quite bad at this, they're always defining ideal future states. And if you can't actually get anywhere near it, you get disappointment builds into the system. People don't trust you. Yeah, and one of the arguments for complexity is start in the present. So when you get to a good future state, you can tell people they're there. Which is much easier because if you define ideal future states, people will interpret it in different ways. You also how you interpret it differently. So you're bound to disappoint some people. Yeah, managing the present is a new political paradigm. Um, you really want to look at polarities and constraints, you know, things which are different working. So again, remember this argument, there's nothing wrong with this, provided you realize the dangers. Side casting, which is what we've been talking about, it's dispositional, it's emergent. Sorry, there's an emis in there. Yeah, it's not, you haven't got either linear causality or endpoint causality. You're basically managing dispositions. You're trying to get the system to evolve in one direction. Uh, modulators, not drivers. Remember we you know, early on the magnet idea on that? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's actually a new way of measuring risk, by the way. If you, it's how you use history. If you can account for most of historical events by the modulators you've identified in the present, you're at low risk going forward because you know what to monitor. If, on the other hand, the amount of the past you can explain by the, by the modulators in the present is only, say, 10 or 15%, then your dark matter quotient is 90 to 85%, and you've got a problem but you don't even know what's modulating the system. So that's an interesting way of using past data to manage future risk. Yeah. Um, you're looking for unimaginable possibilities which are more sustainable. You're dealing with rough, rough guidelines. You're not trying to force people into a thing. And we've got disposition mapping outlier events. You've done safe to fail probes, micro scenarios. Um, remember that sort of micro, scenar micro narrative stuff? BC Forestry, every week, foresters come up with small scenarios about the future. And the big scenarios are those landscapes. So we've got a dynamic, continuously changing scenario. Right? And that's a switch to what's called micro scenarios from real scenarios. We're building a system at the moment, by the way, for governments. We're getting university. This is going to force me to spend a week in Hawaii, which is a real burden, all right? Really going to suffer for this one. Um, we're getting PhD students around the world. And Stellenbosch is going to be one of the partners on this, I think. Yeah. Um, to actually tag their political studies into the software. So actually we've got not in current news events being tagged by people from radically different cultures. That then gets sold to government as a database, so I can look at data from different cultural perspectives, then I can ask a question of the network in real time to actually inform government policy. Uh, Singapore will be the first customer of that as we go through. But again, you get this point about human sensor networks. Right? Um, and that's kind of like the key issue here. And I say, future backwards is one of the techniques in this space. What you're doing is you're casting around to find out what are the evolutionary potential of the present. Now, a famous quote from Seneca on this, you know, we can know the present, but we can't know the future. So why do we give up the certainties of the present for the uncertainties of the future? Yeah? And actually focusing on describing the present stimulating the present to see what will evolve allows you to create more sustainable, more resilient. And interestingly, when you then get success, you can celebrate success because success isn't a disappointment against an impossible future state. And that works at a small level over short time horizons and also over longer time horizons. And the final point, what I've been trying to get is a concept we use a lot in the 17th called praxis. Praxis is the interaction of theory with practice. When we started this work, we didn't want to use an empirical model of research because human systems aren't really susceptible to that. That's the case-based approach. You get correlation, causation, people don't understand context. We took a medical model. So what happens in medicine is doctors and surgeons take models from biology, from chemistry, from physics, and then they see how they work in practice, and their practice and theory constantly modify each other, and that's called practice. Yeah. Now, I've given you some of the theory. I'll give you more tomorrow. Complexity theory, cognitive neuroscience, cognitive anthropology. Yeah, you take that theory, you apply it in practice, you see what works, you modify the practice, you modify the theory. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a different model, 
from actually what you get taught at most management schools is they try and give you the recipe. Now recipe books are fine, provided you've got all the right ingredients and you've got the same kitchen as a recipe book user. Yeah. And the trouble with management consultants is they love recipes. Um, one of the interesting, if you want to measure a management consultant, you check their partner to consultants ratio and their utilization levels. These are the key indicators. If the partner to consultant ratio is 1 to 5, 1 to 10, it's an apprentice model. If it's 1 to 20, 1 to 30, it's a manufacturing model and they'll just give you something they've done before. Yeah? And the other thing, if the utilization rate for their key consultants has gone above 70%, don't employ them uh, because they've lost the capacity to learn. Yeah, and the, the general rule of thumb is 70% for consultants, 30% for partners. It's why the rates are high, because you, yeah, they need to earn more, because actually you need them to spend more time thinking and working around. So check, the ratio, check those two ratios, because they're a real indication. The problem is these days, consultancy firms have gone to very high utilization levels, yeah, and they've gone, therefore, to very high, you know, lots of, lots of consultants feeding a small number of partners, so there's no mentoring. As a result of which, what you get is recipes. And the trouble is we encourage this, because we say, show me where you've done it before and what result I can get. But if it's complex, you're going to get a different result anyway. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with recipe book users is if they haven't got the right ingredients, they fail. Yeah. On the other hand, if you've got a chef, yeah. um, this guy's Sean Hill. If you ever come to Wales, he's created two Michelin two-star restaurants in Welsh pubs. <coughs> he refuses to have a fancy restaurant where you can book. He likes to cook in pubs. So actually, outside his pubs, you have to go and queue for three hours beforehand. Yeah? Um, he's a chef. He's got two types of knowledge. One is he's been through an apprenticeship. His hands know how to do things without him having to think about it, just like London taxi driver. Apprenticeships take two or three years. doesn't matter what human task you've got. The body has to co-evolve with the brain. For a huge amount of human knowledge, you actually have to physically change to manage it. Yeah? But he also knows the theory of cooking. He knows theory and he knows practice. So if he hasn't got the right ingredient, he can substitute or he can break the rule. It's like if you look at it, brilliant directors, they do conventional films before they risk an art movie. Picasso was a wonderful conventional painter before he took revolution because once you've got your craft, then you can break the rules to create an effect. Yeah. So part of what I've been trying to teach today, and I've timed it almost exactly for 4.30, so it's Benny's fault if he's not here, it's kind of like what we're trying to do is to build a whole new approach to management based on creating chefs rather than recipe book users. Because in a dynamic, uncertain space, the ability to fall back to theory when the recipe no longer works is key because then you can adapt quickly. So I've tried to mix theory and practice today. I'll move up and use more of that tomorrow. Okay. Now we've got lots of options tomorrow, so I'll put them all up tomorrow and we can make a decision. I know what I'm doing in the first session. But I just want you to think about it overnight. We can look at organizational structures, things like teams, social networks, building crews. We can look at archetypes. I mean, we can, you can actually have all of these, and we'll just spend less time on it. It's your call. Right? Um, we can look at archetypes and the way they're used to disclose culture and to get knowledge results across. We can dive deeper into the complexity side. Yeah, complexity and chaos are really interesting at a strategic level. So we can go into sub-models around that and look at the way they work. So, have a think about the stuff we've done today. What I'll start off with tomorrow is I'll put up a slide with options. And at the coffee break, we'll make a decision about what we do after that. Okay? And the other option you've got is to come up with something completely different. I don't mind. Right? If I'm genuinely I'm a chef, I should be able to cope. So this is a chance to cope. Oh, I have purple characters. Well, you, you can do... Well, let me give you an example. Right? One of the ones we did for Bristol Myers Cribs years ago is we did archetypes that senior leaders had about themselves and archetypes that senior leaders have of employees. And then we did archetypes that employees have of senior leaders and archetypes that employees have of themselves. Represented as cartoons and we put the executive board into a room with those four walls. They didn't come out for five hours. Yeah? Because they actually showed radically different perspectives. And so archetypes, if you look at archetypal stories in history, Archetypes represent culture. So, for example, all, all huge stories have what's called a trickster archetype. Now, the two story, if I take two traditions, you'll see the difference. In Norse legend, trickster is Loki, who's a fire demon. Yeah? 
don't forget Hollywood, all right? Hollywood is ruining Norse legends, all right? And don't talk about you looking at Thor in 3D. I'm getting worried about you on that, all right? Um, sorry, I just thought I'd humiliate you a bit. She shouldn't say things like that. Um, what actually happens, Loki, human knowledge advances because Loki destroys things just for the fun of destroying them. Now, you contrast that with the coyote in Navajo legend. The coyote is humankind's friend and deliberately tricks human beings so they discover things and steal things from the gods. Now, it's the same trickster, but it manifests differently. It tells you a huge amount of difference in society. So actually, revealing archetypes is powerful. And so the Absa Bank ones were fascinating um, because they actually showed actually deep in trained racism. And I'm quoting the marketing director. He said, we're still racist, aren't we? And you know, you know, the issue is it's a way of revealing different cultures. Yeah. And then the architects, once you've got them, can be used to have more difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Because displacement onto an archetype is an historical way yeah, of actually explaining things you don't want to talk about yourself. Yeah. But we've got two really good ones on that. What's the, there's the South African Agency? CSR. Yeah, CSSR is a good one. And then there's Absa Bank. So I'll show you, but I, if we do that, I'll show you both of those.